Prior to 1838, people with mental or emotional problems in the Sydney area were housed in a lunatic asylum at Liverpool or in the female factory at Parramatta. Governor Burke informed the Colonial Secretary in 1835 that a lunatic asylum is an establishment that can no longer be dispensed with. In this colony, the use of ardent spirits induces the disease called delirium tremens, which frequently terminates in confirmed lunacy. Within months, the British government authorised funds for the project. Frederick Norton Manning was appointed superintendent to Tarbon Creek, as it was then known, in 1868. He immediately reported that the accommodation was prison-like and gloomy, and the patients isolated. In 1869, Tarbon Creek became the hospital for the insane, Gladesville. Henceforth, patients would receive treatment for their illness. Manning oversaw radical changes in patient care and accommodation. By 1879, the hospital had been extended and modernised, the use of restraint was minimised, and there was provision for patient activities rather than patient isolation. In 1915, the complex became known as the Gladesville Mental Hospital. All inpatient services ceased in 1997. The future of this remarkable site is not yet clear. A lot of people were caught up in the system that we would never regard as uh, being mental health patients today. You know, people with alcohol problems, uh, uh, homeless uh, people, people in the community uh, who were uh, people simply wanted to get lock away. You know, get out of get out of the site. One person who was here, for example, was um, Louisa Lawson, uh, Henry Lawson's mother. And uh, in her final years, she was, uh, I mean, she was an incredibly important feminist and uh, an editor and author in her own right. And, and, but in her final, uh, final years, she was pretty destitute and uh, having problems. And she was in here for, I think, almost till when she died. Uh, yeah, notice that the name of the bay here is Bedlam Bay. And um, it's interesting because uh, this being the first um, insane asylum, if you want to call it that, um, established here, that, that the term Bedlam was applied to it. So this place, this place was never, the hospital was never known as Bedlam, but the point and the bay were known as Bedlam Bay. Of course, they once they decided to develop the asylum, they had to surround it with a, a, a wall of sufficient height to keep people in and to build the wall they had to bring uh, uh, stonemasons from uh, Cornwall and uh, well, the wall's been lowered here a bit but uh, from Cornwall and some of the other places and uh, many of those settled in the area and built a lot of the stone houses that you can see back up in the streets in Gladesville. This you can see work. the folly here or whatever. Yes. Uh, Sadly, the folly has just about collapsed. The roof's fallen in, but it was a beautiful, mad uh, garden construction. We think this was probably a ha-ha wall. And what a ha-ha wall is, is the wall from a distance looks quite low and it's in design so that it doesn't block out the view. But on the other hand, what normally would have been here was a deep ditch. And so anyone coming from outside trying to escape would have had to go down the ditch and then they would have had a tall wall in front of them. But they could stand over there and see the view. Yeah, looking across this point here, that would be Bedlam Point just around there. And that's the original ferry crossing and that was the great, great North Road. This is the way people travel to Newcastle. The punt came across from there and that was the Bedlam punt. This was the uh, original wharf for the punt and you can see the other one on the other side on the uh, left of the boathouse. Oh. It was a hand operated punt originally, it used to come across here and uh, and this was the Great North Road. This was the way that you travelled from towards Newcastle. You uh, turned off Parramatta Road down there at just over one of the creeks and you came up what's still called the Great North Road. Um, cross over here and then there are little bits and pieces of roadway going north eventually to the Hawkesbury. Just past Gladesville Hospital and the Old North Road, we pass by Banjo Patterson's cottage, where he lived with his grandmother during his senior school years in Sydney. It's a restaurant now, but the rooms are still much as they might have been 140 years ago. Patterson was in every sense a great Australian. Ballad writer, horseman, bushman, overlander, squatter, he helped to make the Australian legend. With a rare touch of the genuine folk poet, and in words that seemed as natural as breathing, he made a balladry of the scattered lives of backcountry Australians and immortalised them. For thousands of years, Aboriginal people lived around Sydney Harbour, fishing its waters, collecting shellfish from the shallows, gathering berries, roots and other plants food from the slopes, hunting birds and animals. 
It became a particularly good place to live about 5,000 years ago after sea level had finished flooding the valley of the Parramatta River to create a magnificent harbour rich in marine food resources. When Europeans arrived in 1788, the Wallamudigal people occupied this area from the Lane Cade River through Ride to near Parramatta. They were a clan or subgroup of the Darug people in what is now Western Sydney. Glades Bay is rich in Wallamudigal history with many traces of Aboriginal occupation still visible. There are middens of shell and bones from hundreds of meals and artworks associated with spiritual and cultural life. A small depression in this sandstone outcrop holds water today just as it would have thousands of years ago. This made it a good place to sharpen stone tools. This is, this is Kissing Point proper. Uh, the name is, is actually a nautical term. People often ask what's it mean. But it's a shallow part of the river where a heavily laden boat would have just touched bottom at low tide. And so they, they kissed the bottom. It's, and it was first taken up by James Squire, uh, who built the, Australia's first brewery back in 1796 or 1798, uh, and went on to, to great fame. At the end of his time, in the 1820s, he was producing something like 450,000 litres of beer a year, which was bringing him an income of a considerable amount, as you can imagine, even at fourpence a pint. Halfway between Sydney and Parramatta, all of the boatmen stopped off at James Squire's wharf and the Malting Shovel Tavern. <laughs> Where was the wharf? The, the wharf was the wharf's actually under the boat shed. The remnants of it are still there. This spot here uh, was in the First World War. Was a, a ship construction yard where a, the biggest wooden ships ever assembled in Australia were were started. Four were contracted for by the Commonwealth government. Uh, two were partly completed, and the other two were cancelled. And neither of them ever sailed. It's quite a quite a tragic story in the whole darn thing. Um, the, the shipbuilders were Kidman and, Kidman and Mayo, Kidman being the cattle king. And then you have to ask yourself, what the hell would the cattle king know about building great big wooden ships? <laughs> and the actual spot that they were here doing it was right here on the foreshore and you can still see remnants of their concrete slipways and there's bits of old iron and rivets and all sorts of stuff lying around in there amongst the rocks. Now, was all, that, all that was owned by Dame Ed, Edith Walker. Uh, it was a convalescent hospital in the First World War. I think again in the Second World War. It's the Department of Health now, in various guises. She also owned the land along this foreshore and put a covenant on building on it, which prevented its subdivision. So that's why all this is. That's why we've actually got it, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant lady. Yeah. Yeah, little patch of Lamander is an old sandstone quarry. That's where the stone came from for James Squire's tavern. End of the 18th century, and sitting there waiting for us. Now you can now say the corner of Halverson's boat shed was constructed in 1940, uh, and immediately into the war, and Lars Halverson's son were producing hundreds, literally, of wooden boats for the war effort, going to the army mostly, but some raft tenders and uh, fast sea rescue craft and the like. Uh, the original Halverson wharves are gone, uh, but this, that wharf was constructed in about the 1960s, late 1960s, it's ramshackle. that ramshackle thing, uh, but the boat shed went to private hands in the late 80s, early 90s, That's the little uh, building and then it's been fairly neglected, the whole, the whole big deal. But there's a development proposal out to convert most of the land into units along the waterfront. The developers of this site have indicated sympathy for heritage issues, but we really need to commission some serious archaeological investigation and historical interpretation before the site is forever disrupted by building works. These uh, sculptures have been recently installed by Council. Uh, they were done by Chris Tobin, an Aboriginal artist. Uh, they're snapper fish, as, as we act as wind vanes and move around gently in the, in the wind. And uh, that, of course, is the totem animal for this area of the Wallamudgical people. And uh, up on the right up here, we have an, an Aboriginal meeting place, which has also been recently put in. We're on the edge of Benelong Park, and this was the area in which the Kissing Point tribe lived from about 1800 through to about 1830 uh, on the land of James Squire, Australia's first brewer. And Squire, of course, has had his tavern and his brewery underneath the Helverson boat shed over there on the horizon. Uh, so pretty, pretty important sort of location. And Squire is the guy that actually buried Benelong, or at least allowed him to be buried on his land. <laughs> We're not quite sure whether he was involved in digging the grave or not. 
<laughs> now, the design of all this would have been done through uh, well, Aboriginal it was done, it was done, Council. Yeah, it was uh, Chris, Chris Tobin did most of the design, I think, right. and, and it was certainly all approved by Metro Land Council. Fantastic. And was that because this was a meeting place or it was just it, I think just symbolic and the fact that it's in the park which was a critical sort of place for a contact tribal group. Uh, the Kissing Point tribe being a remnant of all sorts of people from all over Sydney. As by, the, by 1800 uh, Sydney Aborigines have been decimated, the lands have been largely gone and uh, the remnants came together and they came to go together under Benelong as their acknowledged leader. Uh, yeah, so, which is one of those things that history doesn't really say. Right. They, they right. tend to write Benelong off as just being an argumentative drunk, but in fact he was not that in any major sense. He, he, he certainly was probably well and truly into alcohol, but so were a lot of other people in Sydney yeah. in 1800. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and he was very much acknowledged by the Aboriginal groups that he was working with. He was seen as a senior man, and so, but he ended his days here uh, on the on this side yeah uh, he, w he was a uh, as a commented uh, he was a senior elder and he took part in some of the last of the initiation ceremonies in Sydney probably over on George's head but just underneath us we have a, a thin Aboriginal midden <coughs> Uh, there's quite a, there's quite a bit of recent fill on the top there where the parkland's been built up, but you can see the couple of different types of shell in the in the original topsoil. This stuff would be contemporary with the Kissing Point tribe, so chances are been long chewed on one or two of those. Who knows? There's a little bit more midden here, just sitting on top of the rock. It's only five centimetres or so thick, but it's got a lot of charcoal in it at this point, which would be the sort of thing you could get a date on if you wanted to follow it up. And the, the rest of the soil in that section is, is again filled, it's got bits of glass and plastic and junk in it. And up on top of it we've got a, some a Botany Bay Greens or uh, New Zealand spinach as it's sometimes called, which was also one of the vegetation food staples for Aboriginal people. We've just walked through Cleves Park there, uh, which has got nothing whatever to do with the historic house of Cleves, which is down on the next corner, <laughs> or was down on the next corner. It was owned by the Blacksland family. But that, in fact, was the garden of James Squire. It was quite a large area from, from the road across there back up to about this corner. And then from here on was his orchard area. Uh, and he had hundreds and hundreds of orange trees, amongst other things, in amongst there. It was producing quite a lot of fruit and veggies for the, for the local market. Benelong is recorded as having been buried in James Squire's orchard, in James Squire's garden, and amongst the orange trees in the garden. So, you know, you think, where the bloody hell was it? Take a pick. Uh, but that was one of my first breakthroughs to find out on, from an old map that, in fact, there were two places, an orchard and a garden. And that really narrowed the target area down for us to where Benelong might have been, because there is no firm record of exactly where he was buried. The earliest account is Sydney Gazette, 1813, shortly after he died, and that's just that general description. Uh, then the, the trail goes cold at that point, and in 1927, the guy that owned this block of land just across here, where these houses are now sitting, uh, Charles Cobb and Watson, and wrote a letter to the Herald saying that uh, he was a descendant of Squire, he'd always had uh, a, a blackfellow's grave on the corner of his property. Since there was only one blackfellow that they know of was buried down here, it must be the grave of Benelong. And there's also a photograph of this alleged grave, which we're able to reconstruct the location of, which is on the next street corner, about 100 yards down from this particular sign. This sign was put in by the local historical society in 1988 as a bicentennial project, and it's simply says that, Berry, that uh, Benelong and Nanbury are buried hereabouts. So there's no good reason for moving it. It's in, a, it's in a fine spot on the edge of the park, pretty close to where we now believe the grave to actually be. When, when Benelong went to, went to Britain, uh, they, they sang, did this song and dance for uh, William Waterhouse, who just happened to have a neighbour who was able to re write all the music down and annotate it. Parabola, parama, mangi wayenguna. 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 Parabola, parama, mangi wayenguna.
was Ben Long's last wife. Uh, he had a child by her, uh, but the child died after marrying Maria, who later became Maria Locke, one of the major descendants of the Dark Group, uh, without issue. So there's no direct descendants that we're aware of from Ben Long. James Squire was probably one of the whites that were able to do that crossover. Uh, Squire was, was of uh, Romani or Gypsy parents uh, uh, and we think that that was probably an important factor in his understanding of Aboriginal people. Yeah. This is the spot, we're on the corner of Watson Avenue, named after Charles Watson at Horden Avenue and to the best of our knowledge the grave is right there. Under, underneath the street sign. Oh, yeah, we've, uh, the way we got to that was through a whole series of illuminations in early maps and records. At one stage there was a tennis court here belonging to, to Watson and he said in 1947 the grave is now under the tennis court. So it had to be between about there and the other side of the road. Then we got the early photograph of where the grave was which was taken from the veranda of a house that was behind this looking down the harbour and we could see the chimney of the Rhodes timber yard in there and a fence along the front and we could work out the scale of the photograph from the fence. We resected all these points and it came to this spot and that, the Ride Council surveyors did that and that was the same spot that I'd previously picked out on process of elimination. Now the, the next thing is well how do you know it's a grave? The answer is we don't for sure. We've just located it as best the historic records tell us. We have run a GPS survey around this corner here, ground penetrating radar, and we have got soil disturbance at this point which is consistent with the depth and size of a grave. Beyond that you can't tell. And, and we, we wouldn't want, I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, if Aboriginal people have sometimes mentioned they'd like to exhume them and put them somewhere more appropriate, if they wish to do that I'd, I'd support it, but otherwise no, it stays as it is yeah. until such time as it comes under threat. Yeah.